today that I should uh, give out a warning. I've noticed that lately, it doesn't have anything to do with age, I'm sure. I um, Sometimes when I'm in a presentation, I'll say something like 100 years or 150 years. Um, if I do that, please add a million to that because it really confuses people when I'm talking about rocks and they say 100 years, that's not an old rock. So just keep that in mind. So here we go. This is, let's see, I need to get rid of some stuff on here. Okay, this is the basic outline of the talk. I presume that a lot of you know about some of the basics of plate tectonics, but just to keep things even, I will um, go into tectonics a bit and then talk about them on the regional scale and then get to the Fidelical Ophiolite and I'll be actually showing some pictures of rocks, sort of a field trip around Fidalgo Island. So, first of all, I need to get rid of some more stuff so I can see the whole slide. Okay, a basic primer on plate tectonics. Um, basically plates, oceanic and continental plates you could say they float over the top of the mantle, which is plastic. The plates themselves are rigid. And so when a plate is spreading, like through an oceanic spreading ridge called a divergent plate boundary, these rigid plates are actually moving over the top of the mantle, the asthenosphere, because it's plastic and it deforms. The basic types of plates are oceanic plate, which as described is in the ocean, continental plate. And some of the, the major features of plate tectonics is the spreading ridge where plates diverge and the convergent plate boundary, which is often called a subduction zone. So in this we see Let's just look at the right-hand side here, which is actually a pretty good depiction on what's happening in Western North America, or Western US at least. You've got a subducting plate with this oceanic spreading ridge just off the coast. Ours is called the Juan de Fuca plate. It's quite a small plate. In the process of the plate subducting, it melts the bottom of the continental crust into magma molten rock, and this rises through the crust. Usually it stops someplace and forms a magma chamber. If that magma chamber cools very slowly, it'll produce a rock like a granite when it solidifies. Often this erupts depending on the stress regime, especially in the plate. If it does, it'll obviously form volcanoes. So that's what's happening with the Cascades. Um, this is also a good depiction because it shows Mount St. Helens right here. <laughs> it also shows um, the Basin Range province down in um, Nevada, southwestern Oregon. It extends all the way down into Mexico, halfway into Mexico. So you've got a compressional regime here where two plates are coming together. You've got an extensional area here and also here. Other features are things like shield volcanoes, think the Hawaiian Islands. They happen in the middle of a plate generated by a hot spot, if you're familiar with that term. And then over here, particularly germane to um, the San Juan Islands and Fidalgo Island, are island arcs. This is where ocean plates converge and one subducts underneath another. So <clears throat> say this is the Pacific plate, Pacific Ocean plate. It's going down underneath this other oceanic plate, creating volcanism, creating volcanoes, but those volcanoes are built on oceanic crust, okay? This shows volcanoes, um, Philippines for an example, that are um, actually daylighting out of the sea. That doesn't necessarily ha have to happen. Um, sea mounts that don't actually rise above the surface of the water are prevalent throughout all the oceanic plates. I think that covers that. Here are the major plates of the world, the earth. I think I counted 14 major plates. Some things to note are 
um, the Mid Ocean Spreading Ridge, which goes right between, don't press that, right between um, the Eurasian Plate and the North American Plate, goes down here. And the Pacific Plate, here's our little Juan de Fuca Plate right off our coast, that's a spreading ridge, that's subduction. The Cocos Plate, that's a spreading ridge, that's subduction. This thing right here is the, the uh, San Andreas Fault. Um, these two plates used to be one and a transform fault shown in the previous slide got subducted. So that's an interesting feature. Um, note that this boundary right here between the North American continent and the Atlantic oceanic crust is not subducting, okay? And so that means that North America is moving west. This mid-Atlantic ridge is pushing the Eurasian plate east. And so what happens in here is the Eurasian plate and the North American plate come together really fast. Uh, the Pacific plate come together really fast. And that can create some very complicated tectonics as you see here. Over there, they've got two different subduction zones very close together, two island arcs formed. The Suna plate is coming up from the south and the east and the, and the west and making another subduction zone and look at the mess down here. So plate tectonics can be very complex. This slide on the North American plate makes it look cut and dry, but it's not. So let's go back a couple hundred million years and look at the supercontinent Pangaea, where basically all of the continents, the continental plates um, had congregated. And again, this is where the North American plate is, or the uh, Mid-Atlantic Spreading Center is going to form. So this is a series of um, graphics showing different times, 230 million years. About 200 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean started to open up. North America went that way, South Africa and South America went that way. 140 million years ago, Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger. 100 to 20, today, here we are. Note also all of these islands out here, oceanic islands. And also over here, I'm going to zoom out, zoom in on this 140 million year old graphic because it's very germane because the youngest rocks in the Fidelgo Island area are about 140 years. So 140 years ago, these rocks were out here. Rocks from Orcas and San Juan Island were out here somewhere too. It's been proposed, some of you are probably aware of the Baja to BC hypothesis that some of these islands or microcontinents, some people call them, came up from Southern California, what is now Southern California, came up over a thousand miles. That's, um, there's some good paleomagnetic evidence for that. Um, a lot of us have a hard time wrapping our heads around that sort of thing, but you can do a lot of things with plate tectonics, whether they're real or not. I want to introduce you, if you don't already know, about geologic maps. They um, have pretty colors, like this one of North America, but they're also useful depicting um, bedrock geology in specific areas. So in this one, the warmer colors are the older rocks. All of the different colors um, designate either a group of rocks of the same age or a group of rocks with a shared geologic history. So this area here is what's called the North American Craton. All the rocks inside here are older than, a hundred, older than a billion years. And then younger rocks around the side, the Appalachian, the Piedmont, and all this stuff over here on the West Coast. Now we can zoom in on Northwest Washington. I think you all know the San Juan Islands, the North Cascades, Olympic Peninsula, which is a fascinating story, but not part of this talk. Um, <clears throat> different colors, again, represent different bundles of rocks that are related, either in age or rock type, usually in age. So the thing that we need to take note of, and I will harp on several times during this talk, is 
the San Juan Islands right here. Look at all the colors. They're the same as the colors all the way up to near the crest of the North Cascades. This is called the Straight Creek Fault, which apparently ends right at the border. <laughs> um, geology does carry on through the border. It's called the Fraser River Fault north of that. It has a displacement of about 100 miles. So it's moved rocks from on this side down and on this side up. So this suggests to you that the rocks of the San Juan Islands are related to rocks of a huge area of the North Cascades. And indeed, this is called a schematic cross section where we're taking a slice of the earth and looking at it sideways. And we see in the San Juan Islands to the left, packages of rock with specific names, um, Eastern schist, things like that. And they, they carry on with the same color, although they have different names. It's the Bell Pass, Pass Melange. They carry on way up until we get to uh, basically the Straight Creek Fault. So this is kind of amazing. It's very thin packages of rocks, maybe five mile, five kilometers thick or so. They used to be out in the ocean and somehow they got from the ocean, plastered onto the side of North America, Western North America, and they're continuous over this huge, um, that's about 70 miles, I think. Also note in this, and we'll be seeing this in a lot, a lot in the other geologic maps, is all of the faults and fractures and things. Just imagine all these different terrains, all these different areas, ocean, island, parks, microcontinents, coming and plastering themselves through the process of plate tectonics um, to the side of the North American continent and just how messed up they would be. They're huge forces and it just doesn't, um, it destroys the rocks, but not entirely since there's some continuity. So now we can get into the, the San Juan Islands and I'm sure you all recognize the larger islands and probably a lot of the smaller ones. Again, we have our colors, mostly older from um, this area and younger up in this area. By the way, dark lines separate geologic terrains. Terrains is not a misspelling. It's a word we geologists use for a package of rocks that share a similar geologic history. And it's very convenient when, when you're talking about plate tectonics where, where thing, different packages of rocks may transport into different places to, um, to name them in that fashion. So a few things about this, different colors or different formations, and I'm not gonna go into the details out into the islands. We'll concentrate on Fidago Island down here. But again, look at all these, these are called thrust faults. That's where um, two packages of rock get faulted against each other at a fairly shallow angle, as opposed to like a vertical angle. That's those, um, these, these darker lines, uh, these darker lines here. The dashed lines are areas, areas that um, include specific terrains. So this is the Fidalgo Island terrain here, okay? This is the Lopez terrain in here. What else did I wanna say about this? Um, old stuff here, some of you probably know about the Chuckanut Formation, which occurs along um, um, Chuckanut Way and up in Bellingham area. It and the Nooksack Formation was actually deposited on top of these rocks after they were accreted to the continent. And that date is kind of tenuous, but most people think it was about 70 million years ago. The rocks range from 450 million years in the Eastern Schist here, or East Sound Formation, to um, the oldest rocks of the Fidalgo Formation are about 170 million years. So if you stand on top of um, one of the ridges on Cypress Island or Guaymas Mountain and look across there, you're looking at 300 years in just about five miles of uh, 300 million years, there we go, um, in a very short distance. So 
it's incredible how these rocks from very, very different eras came together in one place. So again, let me back up here. I'm gonna look at another cross section along this line. So we're cutting the crust and looking at it sideways. And this is very stylistic. We don't actually know what's happening below there because it's way down there and nobody has the money to drill and look at the rocks. So we got the Fidalgo Ophiolite on the far east overriding all of these other terrains in the San Juan Island area. Going from 450 million years to the youngest sediments in the Fidalgo Ophiolite, we'll get to that in a minute, are um, about 140 million years old. Okay, we're gonna take a short intermission. That's about it. Dale wanted us to stop at a particular place or two and see if there are any chat questions. Anyone have any questions about the basics of plate tectonics or the um, tectonic framework of Northwest Washington at this point? You are welcome to hold your space bar down pause for about one minute and then speak your question. I don't see anything showing up. Alternatively, you can- In the interest of time, we'll keep going. Going to zero in on island arcs a little bit more. Again, ocean, ocean plate subduction. This generates magma, which rises up into the top part or middle part of the oceanic crust and uh, most all the time creates a volcano. And again, this volcano may be submerged at the end. This is something like the, um, some of the real old rocks on Orcas Island, but also the Fidalgo Ophiolite. Here is kind of a stylistic cross section of the Fidalgo Ophiolite. And there's that word Ophiolite. It's a section of oceanic crust and the underlying upper mantle it's been uplifted and exposed above sea level and often in place onto continental rocks. So that's the history in a real nice long sentence and the definition of an ophiolite. So what we have is serpentinite or ultramafic rock at the very bottom. This is part of the upper mantle and that's part of the lower oceanic crust. It's above the asthenosphere, which I mentioned in like that first plate tectonic slide. And then above that, we have igneous rocks. Igneous rocks um, solidify from a magma and or a lava. So down here we have gabbro, layered gabbro. I might talk about, I will talk about that later. And then we have volcanic rocks, andesites and basalts. And then we have um, something I didn't mention that um, is very common in an extensive environment like a mid-ocean ridge is as the plates move apart, you've got lava coming up in the middle there and it comes up as long linear, what are called dikes, just slices of lava come up and solidify. And then those dikes split and more lava comes up between them. And so you've got um, dikes that are parallel and vertical and in oceanic ophiolites, and there are many exposed around the world. There's one in um, Cyprus in the Mediterranean that has miles and miles of these um, layered dikes, they're called. Interesting feature. So then we have um, a package of sedimentary rocks right on top of all these volcanic rocks. So that means that volcanism ceased at some point. And since this was in the deep ocean, um, deposition was very, very slow because there aren't, there aren't sediments coming off of the continents. All the sediments are real clay-sized particles and or, and or marine organisms 
So basically you get clay and you get closer to a continent or get closer to another volcanic arc and you start getting um, siltstone and sandstone from that volcanic arc. Here are some of the ages. Like I said, about 140 million years for the youngest and about 170 million years for the oldest igneous rock. It's impossible to date ultramafic rock. It just doesn't have the minerals or the compositions that you need to date it accurately. But you can guess that it's very, very old. I wanted to um, give this book a plug by Ned Brown. He was kind of my mentor as an undergraduate at Western Washington University. And if you're interested about the geology of San Juan Islands, this is, this is the go-to place. It's very access accessible for non-geologists, very good explanations, very good graphics. He let me use a lot of the graphics in this presentation. It's, um, I checked, it's not on Amazon, um, but you can get it at uh, Village Books in Fairhaven online, or next time you're up there, visit the place. So there is, a geologic map of Fidalgo Island and some of the little islands to the west. Again, I want to point out how fractured this package of rocks is. All these dark lines are faults. That's another fault, the kind that's called a thrust fault that I mentioned earlier. Um, these lines are contacts between different rock types. So if you look at what, what we like to do is take these things and try and reconstruct what the original stratigraphy was or what they originally looked like. And <clears throat> that's what that column was a few slides back. But if you look at this blue rock, which is a volcanic breccia and this blue rock, there's been that much offset on, on this fault. So it's been transported that way quite a ways. And this is um, an andesite basalt area. And um, we don't know where that was. This probably thrust, this, these um, sediments probably thrust over it and covered it. So it's probably below these sediments. So just really, really broken up. And down here in the southern part of the island, same thing. It makes it really hard to, to reconstruct the original configuration of the units, but it usually can be done, sometimes using one's imagination, got to admit. Um, this is the gabbro that was shown in that um, stratigraphic column. These are um, different types of plutonic rocks. Now plutonic rock is a magma chamber that doesn't erupt or, it, or some of it might erupt, but a lot of it will stay under the surface of the earth and it cools slowly. And as it cools slowly, individual minerals nucleate and start to grow and they grow bigger and bigger. And think of a granite. Most people know what a granite looks like. It has fairly big crystals. You can see fairly big mineral crystals. You can see by the naked eye. That's because it's been sitting down there and cooling slowly and allowing time for those crystals to grow. I compare that to a basalt or an andesite or any sort of, almost any sort of eruptive volcanic rock. And it's usually very, very fine grain. You can't see individual crystals. Although in some you can see what are called phenocrysts. Um, that's because it flows out to the surface and quenches and doesn't allow any time for the mineral crystals to grow. So that's the main difference. So we'll see some pictures of some of these different plutonic rocks a little later on. Here's some of the sediment up here and here and all this stuff down here. This argillite is um, interesting. It's, it's this real fine clay stuff and we'll, that's been lithified and made into rock. And we'll see why we know it's from the bottom of a uh, deep sea. Also look at these little things. These are called strike, strike and dip symbols. And they just show how much the rocks have been tilted. So all of these rocks started out like sedimentary rocks, more or less um, horizontal, okay? Certainly the layering and the gabbro started out horizontal. 
This shows that they've been tilted, been tilted to the northeast, 45, 60 degrees. I thought I saw, yeah, there's an 85 degree tilt in here, almost vertical. So this gives you another idea of the huge tectonic forces that crumpled these um, formations, all these different islands throughout the San Juans and the North Cascades against the North American continent in the process called accretion and just kind of stuck them to the continent. Of course, this was farther down from the continent edge. And over time, they have um, risen up to surface level and gotten eroded so we can see what was down there, just like a granite. A granite was formed in mid crust in most cases, and it's been um, uplifted and then eroded. Okay, some rocks. The serpentinite is the upper part of the mantle, as you might recall. This is Washington Park, which is on the far northwest part or west part of Fidalgo Island. So what you're looking at here is actually a part of the upper mantle, which is probably 10 miles below the surface, seven to 10 miles below the surface of oceanic crust under an oceanic arc. Um, it weathers to a brown, but it's actually a fresh surface is actually green. I've got most of these macro images. They're about two centimeters wide to give you an idea of what it looks like a little closer up. And um, this stuff, it's called serpentinite because the original mantle was called, um, it, just call it an ultravafic rock. There are a bunch of different names for it. But through, through um, in contact with water and high temperatures, it metamorphoses into serpentine, which is a class of minerals which actually include asbestos that people use for, um, for insulation or used to. So here's another little, it's a slice of the earth, which I always think is interesting. Um, and this area is probably where that serpentinite came from, quite a ways down in the crust. Another thing I like to point out on this is, this is extremely what's called vertically exaggerated. The crust of the earth, which is called the lithosphere here, looks like it's really thick. It's actually, and I checked this, I actually measured, there, it's actually about the thickness of an apple skin in relationship to the apple. So it's just a very, very thin layer on the top of the earth. And sort of an ironic thing, everything we know about the earth, we get from that very, very thin layer. We've never drilled through the crust, either oceanic or continental crust. Continental crust can be a hundred miles deep. Um, so everything we know about the rest of the earth is pretty much from seismic studies that can tell the difference between different types of rock down, down deep. The twin sisters, I didn't note, it, note in that cross section, but it's really interesting. I think most of you know that's west of Mount Baker. Um, it's all ultramafic rock from the mantle and somehow it was thrust up into the North Cascades. And an interesting fact with that is that it's the largest ultramafic massif exposed on the face of the earth, which is quite a distinction. Here's some gabbro, which is at the bottom of the magma chamber. It's a very dark rock. I've got a diagram a little later showing, but we call these primitive igneous rocks. And usually the darker they are, the more primitive, primitive they are. In other words, the more they're chemically and mineralogically like the upper mantle. So when a magma chamber cools, um, certain types of rock kind of rain down on the floor. So here, what we're looking at is very iron and magnesium rich and silica poor rock. And that tends to be very dark in color. And you might see these layers. And I mentioned the layered gabbro in the geologic map of Fidalgo Island. Um, that just shows that these minerals nucleate 
and they're still in a melt. They're still very hot, 100 degrees Celsius, and they settle just like sediment in water, except a lot slower. A uh, different kind of igneous rock. Okay, look at this. Oh, I don't have an inset for that. Anyway, it's really dark, um, which is also found on Fidalgo Island. It's fairly dark, but it's starting to get these white minerals. That means it's more, a little bit more evolved, not as primitive, not as much like the, like the mantle. And then diorite is either even um, fewer dark minerals, fewer iron and magnesium rich minerals and more white minerals called felsic minerals. So this is the stuff we've got a really good date on for um, the formation of the island arc that is Fidalgo Island. And I also mentioned that um, when these erupt, these would be called andesite, which is most of the Cascade volcanoes are made out of andesite. This is an interesting rock that I haven't talked about yet, but when a rock is very evolved, it has very few dark minerals. There's just a little bit of biotite, some mica, and a lot of quartz and mineral called feldspar, which is prevalent in igneous rocks. You can see how white it is. And pockets of these occur, small pockets, throughout. And they're more, they're just more differentiated um, portions of the original magma chamber. Okay, I debated whether to put this in or not, but try and give you an idea of what's called magmatic differentiation. So uh, magma body, hot molten rock starts off 1,000 to 12,000 degrees Celsius. And you get a lot of real iron and magnesium rich minerals. And you get some um, calcium rich and also silica rich minerals coming out, but not as many. As things cool, the mineral assemblages that nucleate and grow change. So they change to these different names. And as you go up here, again, you get less iron and magnesium. And as you go up here in the light colored minerals, you get less, um, you get more feldspar and more quartz until you get to the top here where you can get a rock that's pretty much all quartz and feldspar with a little bit of mica, which is that uh, plagiogranite granite I showed earlier. So there's, there's a lot to this process, but it's very, very interesting. And it's important because it makes up a huge amount of the continental crust. A few, a couple um, pictures of basalt. This is actually part of the Fidalgo pro, um, Ophiolite. This is not, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. I don't have a good, I won't talk about pillows. So let's get into sediments. Right over the igneous rocks, the first sediment that we see is called sedimentary breccia. A breccia is a sedimentary rock made up of large angular clasts. And that's what these are right here. And there's a matrix of finer mud, um, oceanic ooze that kind of sticks them all together. This is a polished slab that Ned did. Each one of these he was able to identify was from the Fidalgo Ophiolite. So this eroded off of the Fidalgo Ophiolite and made its own deposit. Above that is a rock called argillite, which is basically um, mud that's been compacted and slightly metamorphosed. And the interesting thing about this is these little guys. These are called radiolaria. They dwell only in deep ocean, abyssal, abyss, in the abyss. And um, they're very small. They, they float and feed on the top of the ocean. And when they die, they fall down to the bottom and they make this oceanic ooze. So that's how we know that this stuff was far away from any continent because there aren't any sand grains and things like you'd expect. And they were, they were dated. There's a whole um, subfield in geology that dates fossils, which is kind of fascinating, but they were dated about 150 million years. 
So on the very top of the sedimentary pile is a rock called gray wacky, and that's just a dirty sandstone, basically. Sand grain sizes with um, mud and things like that in them to make them dark colored. They're not pure quartz like you'd expect um, many sandstones are. Um, there are also some oceanic creatures in there. So we know that they were deposited in the, in the deep sea. So here is a theory of how all these rocks came to be. This is the Fidalgo volcano. At some point, it stopped erupting. We see that by, all, we've got lots of igneous rock, and then all of a sudden we've got sedimentary rock on top. So it stopped erupting. But then we get this breccia, which is made up totally of pieces of the monolith, the volcano, of Fidalgo Island. About the only way to do that is um, it's not unusual that when after a volcano stops erupting, it actually actually collapses on itself. And so it might have been what's in geology is called a graben, and <clears throat> a bunch of breccia fell down off the sidewalls and made a layer right here. Then on top of that, we have these little radial area shining or settling down from sea level and depositing there. And then we've got this active arc here, which would certainly very likely erode and send this gray wacky type material over to cover this. Now this is not really all that unusual. It seems fantastic, but originally the, um, the subducting slab was right here. And so magma was created, erupted, etc. But for some reason, change in dynamics of, um, of plate tectonics, it stopped subducting and a new subduction zone was formed outboard and generated a new volcanic arc. Remember those pictures I showed with all these volcanic arcs about 140 million years ago sitting offshore. That could be one way that this sort of scenario was generated. And some more rocks that aren't directly related to the Fidalgo Ophiolite, but that I find really interesting. Um, there's a place called Cap Sante in the northeast side of Fidalgo Island. And it's just east of the, the big marina, just off of downtown Anacortes. And it's a, it's a city park, but it's got these very different looking rocks from anything we see in the Fidalgo Ophiolite. They're strongly metamorphosed. That means that a lot of pressure and heat have been applied to them after they got buried in the earth and then compressed and heated. And you can tell that because of all these clasts in here, which have been flattened. That's a lot of pressure to do that to rock clasts. This is actually part of the Lummi formation. And it's just a little sliver that's um, included on the Northeast side of Fidalgo Island. And I bet a lot of people have been out to Rosario Park, Rosario Head in the southwest side of the island and walk out to the head and you see these really cool structures called ribbon chert. And these are also formed at the dark in the deep ocean. This is all probably radial area and other skeletal remains of marine organisms that um, were deposited in the deep ocean and then made into rock. And then in the process of getting thrust onto the continent or against other terrains, it got folded. And it's just fascinating to, to look at because it's really complex stuff. And I didn't, I didn't uh, manipulate these images. I actually took these with a, and there was a beautiful sunset going out, going on at Rosario Beach. So that's why they've got that nice orangey tint. So in summary, Fidalgo um, volcano was fairly short lived, about 30 million years, and then it stopped. And then, um, well, actually, probably 20 or less million years of active volcanic activity. And then it stopped, and all these sediments were deposited, and they were assembled with other 
terrains, not just Northwest Washington, but maybe from much farther away. And then accreted to the continent about 70 million years ago. And that's all I got. So be happy to entertain chat questions. I know you have some. Uh, I, I wrote I wrote my questions on chat. Okay. Uh, this is Lincoln. I have a question. Um, that church. Dale, are any questions coming in? I don't see any. Yeah, we we do have some questions in the chat. Can you not see them, Scott? Um, so one from Carolyn, she's asking, um, does this terrain extend up into the Gulf Islands as well? And how far north? Uh, Hail, you're uh, muted. So you, you can't hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Fine. Scott, can, can you hear okay? Sorry, I had my speaker down. Uh. Oh, okay. So um, the, the question from Carolyn is, does this terrain extend up into the Gulf Islands as well? And if so, how far north? No, um, it's pretty limited to south of the border. Um, most of the islands in the Gulf Island chain are um, Nanaimo formation that was deposited on top of the <clears throat> San Juan Island terrains. And we have one from Gloria here. Gloria is asking, are the plates continually floating around the planet and will they change direction again and again? They certainly can change direction to a point, but they're almost always measure, um, moving um, perpendicular to the spreading center where, where the two plates spread. And in those areas like the Philippines where you've got several plates colliding, it can get complicated because they can kind of rotate in there and kind of smoosh into other places and actually go in different directions. But in general, um, they're moving perpendicular to the spreading ridges. Art and Sharon are asking, can you recommend any other books on the geology of the San Juans? Really, that's the only approachable one, I think. There are lots of um, scientific papers out there. Um, but I think that's your best bet. When I was looking on Amazon, I did see a couple volumes set from 1927 on the San Juan Islands, but I think that's a little out of date. We have another question here. Are the recent seismic events due to the subducting plate? Definitely. Um, the subducting plate is also driving the San Andreas Fault and we all know about that. Um, the smaller earthquakes are pretty much all um, events brought on by subduction. Um, the big one, when it comes, not if, um, will be a, a, a big quake. And it will be probably the subduct subducting slab failing in a major way and creating that shock. Here's one from Mark. Ned Brown's book on the North Cascades is also very interesting and relevant to the geology of the San Juans. Book on the North Cascades, that is mountain building book, his recent one. 
Um, he's, he's a good writer. Another question, are Vancouver Island and Haida uh, GWAI terrains? Those are um, part of a huge group of rocks called Rangelia. And they have a very distinct separate history from what we see in the Northwest part of Washington. And I don't know a lot about them, but they're very extensive. And um, Vancouver Island was like a microplate, I believe. And it came in and accreted to the continent but people are thinking it might have also come south a little bit and helped funnel and, um, and direct our San Juan Island terrains into a fairly small area. <clears throat> That's one theory. There's a lot going on around here. Indeed. Gene is asking, how thick is the ophiolite? The ophiolite... Um, you know, that's a good question. Leave it to Gene. <laughs> um, I'm thinking reconstructed, it's probably about four miles thick, maybe three. That's just a guess. And one from Gloria, Western Montana used to be a tropics millions of years ago. Is that because our plate was way south near the equator at the time of tropics? No, it's just another incidence of um, global climate change during the early part of the Cenozoic, Paleocene and Eocene. The climate was remarkably warmer. In fact, the Chuckanut Formation that I mentioned that's around Bellingham and <clears throat> places in the San Juan Islands um, has palm fronds in it. So it was, it was a tropical environment. You're right. Lincoln is asking, was the chert used by early Indians for stone tools? That I don't know, Lincoln. I would suspect it'd be a good candidate since there's no like flint material around here or anything like that. You yep. have another question. What caused the different layers in the ribbon chert? That's an interesting one. For a long time, they thought it was these radial area raining down and getting deposited. And then there was some sort of event from somewhere where a bunch of fine clay particles got in and got deposited on top of it. And then another protracted period of radial area running down. So that would explain the layer, layers. But now they're thinking that during metamorphism, when this stuff was buried and heated up and compressed, um, through some chemical beans, there was differentiation between the radiolaria stuff and the, the earthy stuff, the clay stuff. And that was, that was how these formed. And that latter theory seems to have a lot of traction these days, but I don't know much more about it other than that. I'm looking back in the chat. I'm seeing some questions from quite a while ago, 10 minutes ago or so. And one is asking about the image you had, the theory of the evolution of the Fidalgo Island. And the question is, is that looking south? <clears throat> that one where there's some um, Fidalgo Island with the Graben in the middle and then another, I don't think we can put a a direction on those sorts of things. I mean, those island chains, as we saw in that that um, diagram with all those different million year, um, were, were kind of aligned north south, but they could have started, you know, northwest southeast, um, and and come in a different direction. It's just you can't reconstruct something like that. Um, another point I didn't make during the initial discussion of plate tectonics is the a lot of the history of the oceanic crust is basically unknown to us because it's continually recycling. It's always getting subducted. So I think the oldest dated oceanic crust, Gene, you might know this, is um, less than 200 million years.
where the oldest rock on earth is, is close to 4.3 billion years or something like that, because it, it eats itself basically. So there's a lot of history in that oceanic crust that we don't have access to because it's gone. Another question, is the ophiolite layer all thrust up on continental crust? Thrust up or beneath or plastered to the side, or maybe all three. <laughs> so you got, you got the continent here and something comes in. It just depends what's weakest and what's strongest. It might go underneath. It might just go like that. It might go over on top. I, I mentioned the Olympic Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> it's a peninsula because the continent was here and there was a big oceanic island out here, really big. And it came in and it basically jammed onto the, the side of the continent. And then the subducting slab brought it up and rotated it like that to make the Olympic mountains. It's just a huge, it's called the crescent basalt because it forms in a geologic map, it forms kind of a crescent out there. It's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. And another, are there drastic differences in resistance to erosion that have controlled island formation? I think that can be said for everything on the surface of the earth, yes. One reason Fidalgo Island is um, fairly well exposed compared to a lot of the San Juan Islands is that um, these uh, plutonic rocks, the granite scabros, those sorts of things are um, typically really hard. So they get preserved. Of course, there are a lot of outcrops in um, on Orcas Island, especially Turtleback Mountain. That's just a huge mass of basalt and that's hard stuff too. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask of Scott that hasn't been addressed so far? I, I have a question. Um, when you talked about, I think when you were talking about Cap Santee, you were showing some pictures of rocks and you said you showed some um, lighter colored material that you said was compressed with the weight of the of the, um, of the rocks, and I didn't hear what that, those whiter um, uh, layers were, le le small, small kind of horizontal lines. Right, those are, um, I'm not sure, they could have maybe originally been pumice, um, could have been some other um, sedimentary class, you know, the cobbles, that sort of thing. Um, that's all, like all the rest of the San Juans, that's all, that was all formed in the sea. So uh, if there was a volcano nearby that uh, ejected some larger material into that, um, that would have been that. I haven't looked at that real closely. That's a good question. Oh, thank you. Are these archives? Uh, 